So we were all told by our parents and teachers not to judge books by their covers, but how will we advise our children and students when even a thorough analysis of those books' pages reveal something significantly distorted from reality? In a world where less than one-third of 1% 1 of people know how to code, an overwhelming majority associate AI with an anthropomorphized killer robot type uh, apocalypse. And although I'm not here to assuage those fears, I am here to tell you that there are far more nefarious, insidious, and relevant ethical dilemmas that are inextricably interwoven into the field of artificial intelligence. Now, that's not to say that super intelligent runaway AI systems are not to be taken seriously, especially considering the notion that a really intelligent AI might deliberately choose not to reveal itself to us. That said, one of the most important concerns we will grapple with, knowingly or not, over the coming decade lies in the ways in which AI can distort our notion of truth by decoupling appearance from reality. And you don't have to believe me, you can take it from former US President Barack Obama. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time, even if they would never say those things. So, uh, for instance, they could have me say things like, uh, I don't know, uh, Killmonger was right, or uh, Ben Carson is in the sunken place, or how about this, simply, President Trump is a total and complete dipshit. Now, you see, I would never say these things, at least not in a public address, but someone else would. Someone like Jordan Peele. That video was created by comedian Jordan Peele using a technique known as deepfake, a portmanteau of the term deep learning and the word fake. And using this framework, an increasingly minimal amount of video of a given person can be used by malicious actors to create photorealistic renderings with matching audio that portray that person in any light the adversary chooses. We've already seen deep fakes used to defraud executives and defame public figures, but I think there's something even more dangerous and sinister than millions of people being able to create authentic looking evidence of anyone doing anything. In the not so distant future, a person caught on camera acting in an undesirable manner will simply be able to label that evidence as a deep fake produced by their enemies. Because proving that a piece of content was created by deep fake is often difficult, but proving irrefutably that it wasn't is an entirely different problem. Deep fakes are a specific implementation of a technique known as a GAN, a generative adversarial network. GANs live within the umbrella of machine learning and often make use of deep learning architectures. And I think at this point it makes sense to step back and define some terminology because I, I hear a lot of confusion and conflation even in the engineering community. So automation is nothing more than processing according to pre-programmed rules. You can think of any robotic assembly line that puts together cars or microwaves or even smaller robots. Artificial intelligence is processing according to pre-programmed rules in ways that mimic human abilities. So you can think of the voice-to-text functionality on your smartphone or your favorite Alexa-enabled device. Now, this may stand in contrast to the Arnold Schwarzenegger Terminator-type images that the term AI often conjures. And this is because the forms of AI that exist today are what are known as narrow AI, in that they are programmed with a specific objective and become incredibly efficient at accomplishing only that objective. This is compared to general AI, or artificial general intelligence, which describes the class of machines that can be taught one task and generalize those skills in order to interact with the world just as humans do across all dimensions. Machine learning is processing according to pre-programmed rules in ways that mimic human abilities and iteratively improve. So whether you use Outlook or Gmail or any other email client, it likely came preloaded with a spam classifier that algorithmically diverts certain messages away from your inbox. But as you indicate that it correctly or incorrectly labeled certain messages as spam or not spam, it iteratively improves insofar as your needs are concerned. Finally, deep learning is processing according to pre-programmed rules in ways that mimic human abilities and iteratively improve without oversight. And I should note that the ability to improve without oversight is a bit more a consequence than a characteristic of the architecture. But if you've heard of supercomputers handily defeating chess grandmasters or guiding autonomous vehicles, those live within the deep learning framework. It's very important to understand that machine learning is not just a singularly rigid mathematical approach, but rather a framework and a discipline with many varieties and subtypes, each with their own advantages and disadvantages. Many people are actually surprised to learn that a majority of these techniques are not new at all, but rather have been refined over decades. It's actually the modern advances in computational power and mathematical ingenuity that have given rise to the current AI revolution. 
There is one technique, however, that, that is new, having just been invented five years ago by a graduate student named Ian Goodfellow at the University of Montreal, and that's the generative adversarial network I spoke about a few moments ago. The very first application of again was an engine trained to take input images of horses, of zebras, sorry, and photorealistically render them as horses. The very next application did the opposite and rendered horses that looked like zebras. However, as is often the case with technology, the complexity of applications has increased exponentially. We were very quickly able to not only translate images, but uh, videos in real time as well. Here you'll see a student who enjoyed playing Fortnite, but preferred the graphics of PUBG. So he created a GAN that would, in real time, generate a frame-by-frame -frame rendering of his Fortnite gameplay, a la the graphical style of PUBG. Here we see a piece of software that NVIDIA released, recently released a beta version of. On the left, you'll see a Windows 95 Microsoft Paint type interface. And on the right, you see a GAN that is interpreting the user input and then reflecting it in a photorealistic landscape rendering. Sometimes, however, when working with such complex technologies, results don't always arise as intended. I like to show this comic where one person's remarking that they're surprised that the robot uprising decided to use spears and rocks instead of missiles and lasers, to which the other responds that if you were to look at the historical data, a vast majority of battles have been won using pre-modern weaponry. And the caption is, thanks to machine learning algorithms, the robot uprising was short-lived. Now, occasionally, some of the unintended effects of these technologies are entertaining, even if a bit frightening. Here, you'll see the zebrafication of the original CycleGAN paper authors. And here, you'll see that same process applied to everyone's favorite photograph of Vladimir Putin. Enter here the concept of adversarial machine learning. Machine learning models are generally designed in static environments, particularly ones in which training and test data are assumed to be derived from the same statistical distribution. However, when these models are deployed in the real world, what intelligent adversaries can do is strategically breach that assumption by supplying maliciously created input. So, just as AI can be used defensively for spam filtering, cybersecurity, and biometric verification, it can also be used by malicious actors to fool those models by exploiting flaws in their training data and underlying architecture. Look here at this fully automated Tesla Model X. You'll notice on the left a first-person view, and on the right, a number of image classifiers that are in real time categorizing the different things they see on the road. Now, of course, the system does not actually understand what it's seeing. It simply recognizes certain pixel patterns and uses those to make educated inferences. But what engineers can do with relatively minimal resources is ever so slightly perturb the appearance of, say, a stop sign in such a way that is indiscernible to the human eye but that will cause an autonomous vehicle to classify it as something like a yield sign. Another pretty cool but also frightening example arose from an MIT experiment in late 2017. Using only low-cost, commercially available resources, researchers were able to 3D print a toy turtle that was able to fool Google's state-of-the-art object recognition engine into classifying it as a rifle, regardless of the angle from which it was viewed. And the implication is that a terrorist could engineer a rifle that airport security would reliably classify as a toy turtle. What we've discussed thus far ladders up to a world in which appearance and reality are increasingly being decoupled from one another. This is a YouTube screenshot from the tragic fire at the Notre Dame Cathedral on April 15th of this year. And you'll see that YouTube's algorithms placed a link to information about the September 11th attacks directly below the live stream. And I don't know about you, but as someone who lives in New York City and grew up in a town that could see the smoke from the World Trade Centers on 9-11, I definitely thought there was a terrorist attack happening in Paris when I saw this. Yeah, even more shockingly, but, but again, sometimes interestingly, AI can deliver real value to consumers and corporations in ways that often mask the deleterious effects over the long term. For example, the Associated Press uses a combination of natural language generation and natural language processing to analyze and summarize thousands of corporate earnings reports every month. Even more impressive, in my opinion, AI can create memes and jokes that utilize nuanced humor and complex grammatical structures like sarcasm on top of modern social phenomena like clickbaiting. Using generative adversarial networks, NVIDIA was able to create photorealistic human faces. And the first iteration of this deployment resulted in impressive renderings, but in low resolution and often suffering from deficiencies, particularly in terms of symmetry. Of course, abilities have grown quickly much more capable. And at this time, I want to just pause and pull the audience and see which of these two photos people think was taken of a real person and which was created by a GAN. 
Uh, so first, just by a show of hands, please raise your hand if you think the photo on the left, on your left, was the one taken of a real person. All right, and now, I guess these are mutually exclusive groups, but please raise your hand if you think that the photo on the right was the one taken of a real person. All right, so it's about 75% uh, with the second. Well, guess what, you're all wrong. Neither of these people have ever existed, and both photos were created by a generative adversarial network. Not only can we generate images, but we can also combine them. Along the top row, you'll notice a few images to which three facial styles were overlaid, with the intersection reflecting those results, all of which look indistinguishable from human faces. Take a second and choose one of the faces from the five in the top row, and then choose another from the three in the leftmost column, and see where they intersect. Notice how authentic looking that face is, but yet at the same time how clearly derivative it is of its two source images. AI and machine learning are not only used to create images, but even more commonly to classify them. An engine was trained on 100 million human opinions of photographs across the dimensions of intelligence, trustworthiness, and attraction. It attained an incredible degree of success predicting human first impressions with unprecedented accuracy. Real world applications range from supplementing virtual try-on software to automated profile picture editing to image targeting optimization. But you may have noticed, and this will play again, that smart was originally a top performing trait until the man took off his glasses, at which point the attractive score jumped a lot higher. We've already seen companies that are using similar software to screen job candidates, but how might that affect people with atypical facial features or certain genetic conditions? This particular engine was designed to be used in conjunction with dating apps and websites. Similar algorithms have been reported to predict sexuality with near-perfect accuracy just by scanning profile pictures. Premium users of a dating service could pay extra to exclusively view profiles that exceed certain thresholds or even have their own pictures optimized for specific prospects. But how might the commoditization of romantic partners alter social macrodynamics, and moreover, how are we to know if an indicator of trustworthiness is itself trustworthy? So what we've discussed this far it really only represents a tiny subset of the ethical dilemmas produced by modern AI initiatives. When we zoom out, we see a host of other ethical issues that span applications and use cases. Who benefits from the implementation of AI? Who decides how and where AI is deployed? Who is responsible for the ways in which AI impacts society? Can artificial intelligence suffer? How do we avoid encoding human biases into AI systems? And then there's the meta-ethical issue of who ought to be the one answering these questions. Should it be politicians, academics, engineers? It's not at all straightforward. So I'd like to close by offering up a thought experiment for your consideration. Existential risks are those that society cannot endure, a concept popularized by a thought experiment called the urn of invention posed by Nick Bostrom. He asks you to consider that there is an urn that represents the totality of human innovation and creativity, everything that ever has been or will be invented. And each individual idea is represented by a colored ball with the color calibrated to that idea's net impact on society. Over the course of human history, technology and innovation have provided massive positive externalities for the bulk of humanity. Even some of the least fortunate in many developed nations today have a much higher quality of living objectively speaking, than royalty of the not-so-distant past. So a lot of the balls, historically, have been white, meaning there's an enormous net impact that accrues to society with minimal downsides. I think the polio vaccine is an excellent example here. Other balls have been gray. You might think of something like nuclear fission. Of course, enormous upsides, but also enormous downsides. And as such, the ethos has been to continue removing colored balls from the urn as fast as is humanly possible. And what Bostrom asks you to consider is, if we are to continue removing colored balls from the urn at this rate, what is the probability that eventually we stumble upon a black ball? One that can't be put back in, one that can't be uninvented, and one that inevitably leads to the destruction of humanity. And the conclusion he hopes you draw as yourself is that this probability is very rapidly approaching 100%. Now, Bostrom is a major advocate of data and privacy rights and wishes the solution were as simple as pledging increased scrutiny surrounding the use of powerful technologies. However, given the state that society is in, he feels the only available solution is something he calls turnkey totalitarianism, which is defined as an omniscient, omnipotent AI system watching everyone's hands at all times. And as soon as it notices that one set of hands is doing something that the owners of all the other sets of hands on balance are likely to find objectionable, it will intervene in whatever way is necessary. 
I hope it's now a bit easier to see that data is sure to be the most valuable resource of the 21st century and that the AI systems that leverage it most efficiently will be the most potent catalyst for change that humanity has ever seen. And in closing, whether you attribute the following quote to Voltaire or to Spider-Man's Uncle Ben 200 years later, it is irrefutably clear that with great power comes great responsibility. Thank you very much.